I'm Melanie Trent, and welcome to our Founders Series at the Foundation for Climate Restoration. It's good to have all of you with us. Um, I am a co-chair for, of the membership committee with the foundation. My compatriot, Joan, is not here. She's traveling today, and I'm glad to be here with all of you. And I would really like to just start, as we typically do, by creating who we are and what we're all about here at the foundation. Our mission is to generate the social license and political will to restore the climate. As I'm reading that, I'm very aware of our speaker for the day, and it, it just really resonates to me to say that we're all about generating the social license and political will to restore the climate. Our vision is a climate restored by 2050. And that climate restoration becomes the overarching goal of climate action by the end of the decade. And what we mean by climate restoration is cleaning up the atmosphere of the CO2 that's built up and bringing it back to below 300 parts per million. I'm going to throw a number at you. We're really all about having a future and climate where our children and grandchildren can thrive. We, we really don't have time to meet everyone personally this evening. If you're here for the first time, welcome. We're glad to have you. I hope that you will be back. Um, and if you leave your name and contact information in the chat this evening, we'll make sure that you're invited. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it right over to Julia Dieterer so that we can move forward with the evening. Take Thank it away, Julia. Much. Thank you very much. I'm on the board of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. And I'll be moderating, interviewing uh, Senator Cortez as soon as he shows up. But I'm going to turn it over to Peter Fakowski, who's the source of the whole um, world that got invented called climate restoration, just to welcome us and update us. Good. Well, Julia, thank you. And thank you, Julia, for all the work that you do uh, from early in the morning to late at night. I, I, I've never been able to call you when you weren't available. So thank you for doing that year after year. Yep. This thing takes hold on you and it's like the alien. You're done <laughs> for. <laughs> I, 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 she may have called me the alien. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, so uh, uh, working into an introduction for Dave Cortezzi, uh, I've started introducing climate restoration to people uh, in this way. If, if, you, if we had a button that you could press that would restore the climate, restore CO2 back to what it was 100 years ago, and that would cost almost nothing, would you press that button? And if, you know, for every, everyone seems to be nodding their head or giving a thumbs up. Yeah, and uh, uh, Carol and I have given that pitch both to people from the far left and the far right. And you know, even people, someone might call a climate denier says, well, absolutely, yes, well, of course. And um, we actually have that method. That is the same method that nature uses to create uh, ice ages, but uh, we're not funding it. You know, we're, we're not pushing that button. And uh, as uh, Melanie said, the goal of the foundation is to create the social license and political will to restore the climate. The reason we're not pushing that button is it's not part of the uh, cl the climate goals uh, socially, especially the United Nations. Thirty five years ago, when they created the the uh, the United was it UNF Triple C, the framework for climate change. Um, they, they defined the problem as eliminating human interference in the climate. 
uh, in 35 years ago, that was okay because we weren't able to see impacts of the climate change yet. And so if we if we stopped causing damage, that would have been fine. Uh, at this point, we need to restore the climate. And that that's uh, what uh, Dave Cortese has been uh, instrumental in. And uh, oh, there he is. And that's what our political work is. Now, what's interesting is commonly in political work, you want to get money for a, a project, money for research, um, and so on. In this case, that money will come if and when it's needed. But what we really need is the government to st standing for people giving permission to temporarily go beyond what the UN says is uh, what we want, or what what what's allowed. So as I said, the the UN said 35 years ago that we wanted to eliminate human interference in the climate, and we're now raising the bar on that to restoring. And uh, Dave Cortese has been the our original and most amazing advocate for climate restoration in in the government side of the world and uh we, we i've known him for six years and um this, he's steadfastly gone through this along with uh tara um where i i saw her a second ago <laughs> on, on the screen so um I think with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Julia, just pointing out this again, re-emphasizing re that most of us, when we think of the government, is like, what can they do for us? And in this case, we just want permission from uh, from Congress, from uh, and ultimately from uh, President Biden, to say that it's okay for us to restore the climate and that we really should do that. We all know that, but uh, if you wonder why is it that the solutions like iron fertilization are called geoengineering. That's an automatic response, I suggest, to the fact that the UN doesn't allow it. And so if you're doing something that's not allowed, you call it a somewhat derogatory term. And um, I just wanna say, last night I was at an MIT reception and got a chance to give the book to the president of MIT. She's a new president, but it's eight months ago. And she's making climate her main focus. Uh, and uh, she got her introduction to climate restoration last night with the book. And she even mentioned the one professor at MIT who is working with us on climate restoration. She actually talked about reducing methane levels. So we're on our way. So with that, uh, Julia, uh, will you introduce uh, Dave and send us on our, our our quest here. Yeah, thank you. Well, it, uh, Senator Cortez, it's such an honor to have you here. I, I, this community of people is dedicated to um, having the new paradigm for climate action, the goal adopted globally such that all action takes, happens inside of the kind of environment our parents, grandparents had that we can give to them. And th there's something that Peter's talked about a lot, which is future generations aren't voting. So why would a legislator um, buy the votes of people not even born and who uh, don't yet vote? And I'm mentioning that by way of deeply acknowledging you, Dave, because I, I've known you for a number of years, and that is how you are about everything you do with the community. And you are looking at future generations. When I first we first uh, interacted with the county of Santa Clara, which you were at that time the head of the Board of Supervisors, that's Silicon Valley to those of you who don't live in this neighborhood. Um, that Santa Clara was doing lots, planting trees, did the, you know, waste, the, you know, they had lots of programs going. And one of the things that we've found with a lot of legislators is they have so much on their plate 
and they're doing so much, but they don't they don't have a place to um, listen afresh and anew for something. And um, we walked in, uh, um, got a meeting with Dave, walked into his beautiful office, and within 10 minutes, he said, oh, great, we're going to write a resolution, we'll run it by you, if you like it, I'll have the Board of Supervisors pass it. I mean, it was, it was like that, it was not, it was like you would expect because climate restoration, giving our children and grandchildren and even beyond the kind of environment that most of us grew up inside of, expecting it to be stable and ongoing, um, you would think that would be just obvious. But um, I, one of the reasons I wanted us to have the opportunity to talk to Dave is um, he's he's he can give us maybe the road map to talking effectively with other legislators because we do want to have the um, the resolution and climate restoration adopted nationally and internationally. So, um, Dave, I thought I would start out with just letting you talk, but one of the things I'd love for you to address is. Um, your climate restoration journey, sure, you know, we talk about on this call, what was your nickel drop moment, each of us, I remember when um, Peter showed me uh, a slide deck about seven years ago, and he got done with it, and I, it, the possibility just was like that, oh, we just need a what by when, where do we want to get, it's like the moon shot, you, you know, you make a target, you don't have the technology, but you figure it out and you do it. And that was my nickel drop moment. Uh, and out of that, it was like, well, what else am I going to dedicate myself to? So Dave, we'd love to hear a little bit about your um, journey in terms of getting climate restoration. And um, I think we'll just start from that. Well, that'd be great. Well, thank you very much, Julia um, and Peter. I, I appreciate very much the invitation and hopefully I can live up to the billing. <laughs> um, you know, the period that was just uh, talked about in terms of the story Julia was telling about coming into the the 10th floor of the county administration building um, in, in San Jose, the largest city in the Bay Area and the third largest city in the state which is the county seat and, and coming in where we have a five person board that was, you know, running what is now an $11 billion budget um, larger than a lot of other public agencies out there. But it was, it was a time when, um, and I don't remember the exact year, um, but it was, it was 2019, ahead. 2019. Yeah. It was ahead of the um, the the first climate restoration summit that was held in the UN chambers, and um, you know we were in we were in a time when you couldn't count on I, I guess we still are in a sense, but you couldn't count on the federal government uh, to do anything, let alone quickly, you know, in in this space, and so you know I think there was. <laughs> There was a, not a lot of understanding by folks working at the global level and the national level about how um, large uh, municipalities and large counties operate, you know, and what they bring to the table in, in this area. And the fact of the matter is, is that, and we talked about it then, all implementation really um, outside of just direct private sector deployment of things but all implementation really happens at that level. It's going to be at the state, county, or local level, not at the at the federal level typically. Um, so, so you, as Julia said, we already had been doing some things when I got to the county of Santa Clara in uh, two thousand eight. At the end of two thousand eight, there was there were no climate stewardship goals or documents. There were there was a complete dependence on fossil fuels. There was no um, alternative energy. Uh, 
path or plan or even uh, early adoption by the county of solar and things like that. We had school districts that were around us, surrounding us, that had made further advances in um, <clears throat> using alternative energy than we had, you know, green energy, and because we really hadn't done anything. So we had been on this path uh, to start getting our own house in order and then realize that, um, hey, maybe what needs to happen is we need to essentially quilt work here. We need, you know, one county at a time, one city at a, at a time, if you're thinking globally, one province at a time um, is are, are going to have to take action um, to to get us to climate restoration and frankly, to other climate goals, I mean, that's the ultimate climate goal for us, right? But but to other, you know, sort of climate strategies and, and even commitments and even policies, it's not, they're not going to happen at the national level, not just here, but in other countries as well, um, given the, the nationalism, the way things were going, um, the president we had in place at the time, et cetera, that was all very clear. Uh, and so I had to, sure in 10 minutes say we can do it because i knew we could do it because it was a simple majority vote three votes and i knew that on something like this i would have the, i would have three votes um uh, and we could get this resolution out and we could then you know we had done some work on other issues um justice issues frankly where we had as a county been we had taken the leadership to um, essentially create coalitions across the country of, of cities and counties that would act together. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's progressive groups out there, like what, one of them was created after that called Local Progress, for example, where they, they just do that by design. They just, they're convening cities and counties all the time uh, to take action with this idea that, um, don't depend on the federal government to, to do it. Like we're all going to die if we wait for that to happen. Um, and so we have to do it at this level. But in that conversation, to finally answer your question, um, I had to get an understanding of what, what are we talking about? Um, what is climate restoration? And, and why is that different than what people or other terms people were throwing out there for, for somebody like me at the time who was involved with 27 other issues and tons of other priorities, I haven't, you know, I, I, I had not broken down the, um, the lexicon of, you know, of, of things. And so I didn't really know what, like, what is the difference between net zero and, and climate restoration as, as we, as we are committed to it, as we were committed to it in the resolution. Um, so once I understood that, um, of course it made perfect sense. Like why would we, why would we try to achieve a goal that's gonna still leave hu humanity vulnerable? And why would we do that? Um, and you see that, you see it in government sometimes, you know? Um, well, you know, I remember the day I was in a social services committee and. They said, our foster youth are only graduating at a 50% rate. So our goal is we want them to graduate at a 70% rate. And I raised my hand and I said, I mean, how is that a goal? Isn't the goal that everyone graduates from high school at 100% rate? I mean, why, why, would, why would we establish a failure goal, I, really, when it comes right down to it? So that's my answer to your initial inquiry, Julia. Yeah, that's great. Okay, good. And then... Um, um, you know, I'm so glad that you ran for the state Senate and won, and uh, you've been in the semin Senate uh, three years? How many years? Three. Three, years. three years, yeah, right. And you were able to bring in a statewide resolution, a, a similar wording, standing, having the state stand for climate restoration. And, um, you know, a resolution isn't, uh, has no budget on it, so it's probably not anywhere near as hard as getting a bill passed that includes a lot of money that's got to be put somewhere else. But still, you know, 
an ephemeral idea. I'm really interested in, you know, I'm, I'm talking from hopefully some of the questions that people will have once we open up the floor, uh, mm -hmm. starting with one. How do you how do you get people to buy into an ephemeral idea where where once you get it, it's like, well, of course, just like you said about 70 percent graduating from high school. Why would we settle for an, an environment that's not going to be healthy? Yeah, um, the in the resolution, <clears throat> you're, you're right, it, it doesn't have. Uh, budget appropriation attached to it, though it doesn't really need to. It is a bill, technically. Um, I think what was important about it, and, and it was, it was interesting for me to watch it and watch the process unfold on SR thirty four, our state resolution. At first, I thought, I mean, I think Tara and I were talking about it um, at, you know, at your request, and, and and you know, hey, do you want to do this? Do you want to mm -hmm. do this? Um, that's always. <laughs> That's always what a good ledge director asks the senator. Do you want to do this? You know, and I said, yeah. I mean, well, what's? It's not like we haven't done this before. We did it at the county, and you know, obviously, it's going to be very similar to that. And and she said, yeah, but this will be the first state to do it. So it's, I mean, it's not necessarily a small thing, or it may be a bigger lift than you're than you than we're thinking. Um, and you know, I mean, I just yes, yes, let's do it, let's do it. But I, I was curious about, you know, after that initial decision and conversation, I wonder, you know, how that age old legislative question will be answered. You know, where's the opposition? Where's the support um, on any bill, on any measure? You mm -hmm. know, if you can know that in advance, it's helpful because you can try to, you know, navigate or innovate around it or politi you know, politicize around it. But um, we didn't know. But I, I did start to realize something right away when my staff ran into the, the you know, one of the individuals that was working the bill. Um, and we have to deal with committee staff, committee consultants to, to make our way through each committee, you know, with a positive recommendation from the chair and, and hopefully a majority of the committee members voting for the bill to keep it moving so it can get to the floor, so it can get, um, you know, adopted. And right away, we got some pushback. Um, and I could tell right away because of my experience working with all of you and what you've all taught me, what I've all learned, where that was coming from, in part. And also a little bit of what I saw was what I've learned since I've been in the Senate for three years. And that is that there's a whole world of environmental lobby groups and organizations that that aren't connected to the climate restoration movement. And so um, that's something we need to work on because, you know, legislation and politics at the legislative level can get as, as simple sometimes as um, we don't know who's behind this or we don't trust who's behind this. Um, s secondly, and, and, and really a bigger issue, um, I think is was a carbon capture issue itself mm. that <clears throat> a lot of the um, would be allies, you know, folks who are generally, of course, allies in the climate movement overall in an overarching way, um, have an issue with with carbon capture. And <clears throat> there's a lot of organizations. I'll be blunt that I think in effect, you know, raise money, um, you know, in, in, you know, sort of fundraise. I mean, they sort of use the idea that we need to kill the fossil fuel industry 110% yesterday um, as, you know, as sort of a throwdown, as sort of a mantra, as sort of a call to action, right? And so send 25 bucks and we'll help get that done. Whoever, I won't mention any names or whoever this organization is. And so if that's your posture and that's what you're promising people who are your constituency or your members, your supporters, and then carbon capture comes along and it's, they view it as something that would prolong the use of fossil fuels. 
um, because, hey, if you're able to restore and you get really good at it, then maybe these fossil fuel companies can can actually generate, you know, more carbon if, if we figure out how to get rid of it than, than we want them to do because if they can do that, they can stay in business, right? And if you're, so look, let me say it this way. If your goal is to put all fossil fuel the whole entire fossil fuel industry out of business ASAP, then carbon capture doesn't have a natural place in that movement, right? If your goal is to clean the air so we don't all die, then carbon capture makes all the sense in the world. But to me, it's sort of amazing that we have politically divided into camps where, you know, um, it isn't just about clean air well it is about clean air but it's about clean air getting to clean air by kneecapping and decapitating the fossil fuel industry instantly now i don't want anyone to misunderstand me i am not pro fossil fuels or you know big oil companies or anything like that but we all know that <laughs> Doing something like that overnight with a piece of legislation is not going to happen. I mean, we could have the greatest executive order by the president in the world. I mean, short of nationalizing all the oil companies, and that still wouldn't that still wouldn't do, deal with global interest. I mean, how do you how do you get to where we need to be in the next three to six years via that strategy? So there's. So we started getting pushback on the resolution that you need to take the carbon capture language. Well, if you take the carbon capture language out, you, you're not talking about climate restoration anymore, essentially, right? Um, so it isn't, I think it's really great that we have, you know, always been open, at least since the first convening I was at over at the UN building, we've always been talking about multiple um, strategies, even around carbon capture itself, right? I mean, how do we, how do we technologically uh, come up with solutions? How do we sort of organically come up with solutions? As uh, I think Peter was talking about earlier, um, you know, how do we, what are the various ways that we can do this? And how can we get back to the original thing? <laughs> how can we get local governments to um, be early adopters and maximize their efforts um, to support those things that are going to work, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of carbon, in terms of climate restoration. Lastly, this idea of going to the state, and then, as I said, you know, Tara said, well, you will be the first state to do this. First of all, that's kind of appalling. <laughs> like, we only have one state that's committed to climate restoration. And is that commitment important? Yes, because there's all these executive agencies, like, uh, you know, like air quality, um, it does Department of Transportation, um, Department of Water Resources. I mean, they are all looking at this saying, oh, my God, the legislature has acted and they have, to use your term, roadmapped where we need to go. They're saying not net zero. They're saying climate restoration is, you know, is the target here. And 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 I think the people that we were that do nothing but sit in committees as staff members and their you know lawyers and stuff and figure out what does this resolution mean? What does this resolution mean? I think that when they realized, hey, this thing's gonna set not just a precedent, but a new standard for the state of California. And I think that's why it's important. And I think because we're so, of the vol volatility of Washington, we need to get every state to adopt these because we need to get every executive agency in every state in the union to be committed to climate restoration as their goal. You know, to I get to use another one of my weird analogies, you know, it'd be like if you were one of those folks who believed in universal health care, you would at least, I mean, no, like really like you, that's fine. Um, I, I tend to fall into that camp, but we have, um, uh, the Affordable Care Act right now, right? We have Obamacare, um, and and that's like as far as we've gotten. But wouldn't you want, if that was your goal, universal health care, every state in the union to adopt a resolution saying, our standard is universal health care. You know, we'll support iterations of that, 
to, you know, if it's helpful in getting there, but that's our standard. And if you really look at with the world on the brink with climate, um, you know, with carbon issues right now, um, why wouldn't every state be committed? And how important is that? I mean, to have every state, because they're all establishing their own clean air standards in their state. They're all establishing their own legislation in their states. They all have governors that can issue executive orders in their states to, to clamp down. They can all measure uh, if they want, you know, uh, pollution coming out of industry. They can all clamp down on their fossil fuel companies if they want to. I've got all of our fossil fuel companies, I guess, the gold industry that's working. Um, they can do whatever they think the proper tools are within their own state. That's the way our country works. But at least at least targeting the same standard that ultimately the goal is, you know, um, you know, this many tons by 2050 and it's, it's got to lead to carbon restoration, not net zero. And it, it, I mean, all it takes is the wrong president to get elected again. I mean, we're, it's not like we're doing that great with any president right now on this issue, but you know, we can go, if we're going to wait and hope the federal government makes that the law of the land, <laughs> um, we might be waiting a long time. It might be just actually going the other direction, right? The opposite direction. Um, so, so that's why I think it's important what we did. And if, you know, if there's anything we can do to help create movement in other states, you know, I don't know what it would take to do that. When we were building coalitions at the county. <laughs> We literally had teams of people that would call um, and we'd use other chapters of organizations that were our allies, like Gore's organization, where they had chapters in different locales in different states and have them put, you know, put the bug in or the pressure on the local officials that they were familiar with. We have people, you know, sort of leveraging their relationships for lack of, way to, uh, lack of a better way to put it, that you kind of have to be in Wisconsin or Arizona or Texas, I guess, if you could ever get there in Texas, but you have to be in those states to actually walk into someone's office and get one of these resolutions introduced, right? I, I, I can't really launch that from Sacramento into somebody else's state capital. We don't have that. Unfortunately, we don't have that mechanism. Um, we probably should, but we don't. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you know, you're a, you are, as everyone can tell, a very open person to new ideas, and and you you, I suggest that everybody, whether they're Republican or Democrat, does have this in their heart of hearts. But uh, you know, I was a dedicated constituent. I had met you. I brought our CEO in, and it was me as a citizen bringing it to you. So. Mm -hmm. That may be the maybe uh, F4CR needs to have a goal this year uh, to ha have a citizen take it to every um, a state legislator in every city this year. In every state, yeah. In every in every uh, state, yeah. Every state house. Look, um, I'll tell you, it's uh, it's it's what happens. Um, over starting in January and pretty much throughout the session, um, in our case, peaking in about March, it, we have legislative days, as folks call them. And it sometimes it's very grassroots. I mean, and, and oftentimes, even if it's a large organization, they will send in three or four people to see me who are from my district. I mean, anyway, he's cattlemen's association whatever you know um any group i'm not just talking you know climate or environment they'll they'll have you know two cattlemen come in and say hey we're in your district and if you ban all stock ponds then are you know we're out of business you know we we need you to hear that it's very effective and and i think in every state house in the country probably there's legislators and their staff members who sit there take notes, and then after you go away, after a half an hour meeting, they say, hmm, we ought to follow up on this and look into it. Let's go look at that California resolution. All right. They, they just handed us the California resolution. Let's break it down. Let's go talk to our legislative council. Uh, let's talk to our committees and see 
if we can move this along in our state. And, you know, it isn't like you have to do all that work yourself. You just need to get it launched. You just need to get it started. And to your point, you just need to get a legislator, uh, hopefully a good persuasive one that will, um, with good staff that's willing to, uh, to work, to work the resolution, to work the bill, as we say. And your job is to be sponsors really. And, you know, I don't, Think, I think we were very much helped by um, FCR and, and a lot of you on this Zoom to get this resolution adopted along the way uh, with support and testimony and whatnot. But really, those legis that legislator that you lead, that's your author in, in any state should do most of the work. So it's not as hard of a scaling job as you think. You, know? you just need that group to go in there and eloquently and articulate make the case in 20 or 30 minutes and, and and hope that the seed takes root that's beautiful that's beautiful um we just got from peter garrett please put the resolution in the chat which we will the california resolution for those of you who would like to see it and use it very good i i think i'm going to open it up for questions now and we have about mm, Let's see, little over 15 minutes for Q&A. So I see Judith's hand first. Thank you. Hi, Judith. Hi. Hi, Hi. Senator. Is it Cortese or Cortese? Or Cortese. Cortese. I, I, yeah. Cortese. Okay, just pronounce, pronounce all the vowels all the way through it. Yeah. Oh, okay, thanks. It'll come out right. <laughs> um, well, I am a proud faculty member at San Jose City College, and I know that you have been very supportive of our local community colleges. Um, so I'm very excited to be here today. I'm looking at this um, from a sort of like a more of an economic model standpoint. Of course, the California Community mm -hmm. Colleges, as you know, we accept 100% of all our applicants, and most of our students are, um, you know, they have a lot of economic issues. So our workforce development is a very, very important part of what we do. And I see a potential, uh, carbon capture in particular is an, it's, it's a tool. It's not an idea. It's an, a real thing. And mm -hmm. it's going to need, um, it's going to need scaling up. You know, it works. We know it works, but we don't have enough of it. And um, California is, I was the leader in the nation in climate um, policy, et cetera. I'd like to hear what you think about the role of the community college, the workforce development in the expansion of climate restoration um, modalities. Um, well, first of all, the, the entire education, public education system in California has a crucial role to play in advancing us, um, which sounds like, uh, you know, a trite thing to say, but believe it or not, it wasn't until this session, until 2023, that the state of California passed and, and got a bill signed to make climate literacy mandatory in our public schools. Okay, so we're this far along, all right? Scientists are telling us we're on the brink and we just finally are going to be teaching kids the basics. And, and it, you know, I know there would be hope. I mean, many of you have kids or grandchildren or whatever. I've gone into classrooms as a visitor to speak to third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders. Out of 30 kids, there's maybe one or two that can give you any kind of a working definition of, of even a phrase like global warming because they're not taught that um, they're, you know, and, and they're anecdotally taught things, right? Like uh, the polar bears are going to go extinct and things like that. They you can, cause they watch Disney or whatever. So they can get, they can get some of that. It's not, it only takes 15 minutes to get them to a, a level of awareness where they're willing, they're willing to take a pledge themselves to reverse climate change, to, to, to restore uh, the climate to, to carbon, um, you know, complete, you know, carbon level restoration, like we're talking about, they, they can get that in 15 minutes from, I say, third grade through, you know, seventh and eighth graders are hard to deal with in the first place, but, you know, those middle ages, middle groups. So anyway, 
that bill passed. We were, I was a proud principal author of that bill. It came out of the assembly by Luz Rivas. I think it's AB 285, if I remember right. Um, and um, if I'm wrong, Tara will correct me. But you can look at, take a look at that bill. But throughout, vertically throughout the education system, we need to be doing this because we've been creating community college students out of high schools that did not have climate literacy classes or courses. We've been, you know, have high school students right now that haven't, didn't have any middle school or, or fourth grade training, you know. So, um, you know, we're kind of graduating kids into um, inaction because the only way they're going to be part of the movement, which, and we need them, is, you know, if they, if they really understand, uh, you know, the, the tremendous uh, threat you know, that we're under and, and what it takes to get us back in terms of carbon restoration objectives to getting us back to where we need to be. So it's, it's, it's not that complicated, you know, um, and we don't need to teach them everything. We need to plan. It's, it's, it's building blocks, right, for what they'll learn later. So I think the community college system answer your question needs to build on these early, now that we have AB 285, to be prepared to build on those foundational building blocks that are going to be coming out of the public schools in, in, in terms of community college enrollment. And by the way, I, I think the community college system in the state is, is one of the most underrated education systems uh, around. I mean, it's just, it's, it's rigorous. Uh, it's inexpensive, relatively speaking, in a time of high student debt, and it's um, just doing a tremendous job. So clearly it has a role to play. That's excellent. And Judith, if you want to reach out to Carol Douglas, who's um, I'm sure going to put her email. She co-wrote the book with Peter Fakowski and is a resource for you if you want to look at building a curriculum, all that kind of things. And we're going to call on Jim Wilson. He's third in line because he works with high school students. So, but now I'm going to call on Becky. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, and uh, I agree with you, the uh, uh, education, climate literacy, uh, understanding of carbonomics and how the different things we do in terms of land use and manufacturing and how we allocate things is very, very important for people. Uh, and the next generation is going to be running things and probably have some of these uh, carbon capture and uh, uh, emissions reduction programs uh, as part of their professional careers, hopefully. But I was uh, wondering uh, if you could identify if uh, uh, the uh, Foundation for Climate Restoration was handing out awards in the state of California for programs that you think uh, could be scaled up uh, to be recognized as uh, uh, consistent with the goal of climate uh, restoration. And one of the things I was thinking of, as I read recently, the County of Santa Clara did uh, uh, establish uh, and is developing something called an agrihood, which mm -hmm. is the uh, uh, combining uh, carbon capture in the soil and agriculture with affordable housing. I mean, I thought it was genius. I'm a big affordable housing advocate and a big advocate for bringing the workforce closer to their jobs. And, you know, I just think that's going to make our task a lot harder. But scaling that up, if I was going to scale up something, uh, I'm in Alameda County, I'd scale that idea up here. But I'm sure there are many other things that the state of California is uh, working on. And you mentioned local government as being part of the uh, programmatic implementation for carbon mm -hmm. restoration. And I was wondering if you had any comments about things that uh, we could boost as being consistent with the resolution that will draw people's attention to concrete actions that they can take. Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, so much of it is on the education side, first, first and foremost, right? All great movements that have that suddenly got traction and, and, and changed, you know, really the entire culture of the country. Think, think tobacco use, for example, um, which would be sort of like the direct inhalation, uh, you know, type of, of, uh, 
challenge at the levels it was at, you know, 50 years ago that we had to reverse that. But um, here, of course, you can't, you know, and there, and there we worked with kids, right? Kids started telling your parents, stop smoking. It's, you know, it's going to kill you. That's what they're teaching us in school. And, and you're going to get can't whatever, whatever, whatever. And, and so those kids were not only growing up to not um, use tobacco, but they were also ambassadors of, of the right thing to do. That's we got. So the children's part of it is, is huge. And I would say, you know, like the Silicon Valley climate uh, youth climate initiative would be a good group or an example of a group. And there's more like that around in, in other communities as well. But, you know, to go give those kids an award, if you're going to give an award and say, we're, we're here to empower you and we're here to encourage you and we're in, in we'll kind of get out of the way because you know what to do. Um, you have the energy to do it. And, you know, the only other thing they need is resources. We got a budget earmark last year of $2 million to support our youth climate initiative in Santa Clara County. Um, mm -hmm. Not, you know, the state, not some weird thing where, oh, you'll work with the state and the state will decide what you get to do. You know, it was, uh, we purposely left it open-ended. We need to do more of that because they, <laughs> If they, they're not going to lose sight of the problem and the challenge, but if they get discouraged, they won't organize. I mean, you just go to meetings and we talk about this stuff and nothing actually happens. You don't have any resources, you know, you go away. Um, and that's what we do as human nature. Um, this is not a good use of my time. And so, you know, I think that's, that's an example of, local organizations at the same level that we're talking about where we need to instill uh, the fight and the courage for change and the culture change um, at the youth level. So, you know, try to try to award, reward those groups or award them if we have awards to hand out. Um, I think at the state level, there, you know, there's good bills around there going in the right direction. We introduced a bill. I mean, one of the things you have to have, and you talked about workforce development a little bit, but um, you got to have a workforce to do the work, um, you know, trained workforce. And I introduced a bill called SB 740. The Senate Resources Committee was the first committee it went to. They tried to kill it immediately. You know what it said? It said, all it said was, is that the workforce standard for carbon capture, um, hydrogen, and, and two other areas of, of emerging technology in, in the climate space, uh, that that the standard, the California standard for that workforce is a skilled and trained workforce, which basically means prevailing wage. And you probably better have apprenticeship programs, you know, before you thrust somebody into uh, working in, in a, you know, what might otherwise be a perilous situation or, you know, perilous situation for others, right? If they don't get it right. So, um, yeah, they want to kill the bill immediately. We had, we had to turn it. It was, I just walked, you know, I was saying, okay, we'll go into this bill. We got all the Democrats. And that'll save the day. The chair was against the bill because it carbon capture was one of the things that we were trying to apply skilled and trained workforce on. Well, the year before, Governor Newsom came to us with a raft of bills that he wanted to, to do about $50 billion in climate investments, as you know. And in, in the language in one of those bills that he was helping to shape, it, in fact, his legislative uh, staff called me and they said, there's a controversy because this bill that we have put forward eliminates carbon capture, eliminates from the state of California, like bans carbon capture from the state of California. I said, that's crazy. You, you got to get that out. And we talked for five or 10 minutes. He said, I agree. We got to, we have to go the other direction and we have to basically endorse carbon capture. So I thought my best argument was, you know, okay, so that was last year's, I mean, when I say last year, 2022. So 2023, I introduced this bill and say, now that we're doing carbon capture, I mean, you know, now that we've endorsed it and we got SR34 and everything, you know, let's make sure we have a trained workforce for that. Uh, nobody would argue with that anymore. No, nope, we're going to try to kill that bill. So believe it or not, <clears throat> well, I, you guys would all believe this more easily than insiders in the Capitol. The only way we could get the bill passed was that if we could get some of the more most conservative um, 
members of the Senate who were sitting on that committee, that resources committee to vote for the bill, including uh, Senator Dolly, uh, for perspective, is the one who ran against Gavin Newsom for governor, right? So I'd go over to Dolly and say, will you please give me an I vote on this bill? I need a courtesy vote. He said, I actually believe in it. I actually think it's, it, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm, he said, I, I'm glad you asked. I was just going to stay off the bill, which means he was going to abstain. But he said, I'll, I'll go for it. And then Senator Jones, who's the most conservative member of our Senate, actually spoke up and said, how can you talk about all, all of you Democrats? He said it just like this. How can you talk about a just transition, a work, a green transition, a workforce transition in the climate space? And then when you get a bill like this that facilitates that, vote against it. How, how can you do that? He's, you know, I'm 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 gonna support it, you know. So we got that bill and then we got some momentum after that, and the governor signed it a couple of weeks ago. Um, no. but each time you do that, it reinforces you know, SR34, what SR34 says, you know, climate restoration, carbon capture, the tools that we need for climate restoration um, are, are are endorsed by the state legislature and the governor. And that sends a big message to the agencies that are actually the bureaucracies that have to implement things, right? Right. Well, That's I hope really you keep clear. us posted on what you need. <laughs> All right, That's we'll really do Great. Um, the, you know, uh, f first of all, I want to say something before I forget it. It's like um, the climate restoration resolution is a stake in the ground. And it's kind of like a maypole. After that, everything has to dance around it. Mm -hmm. It's the standard. And, you know, um, so you know, that's the first thing. Otherwise, it's more of everything else that's already around and it goes. So I'm, I'm getting very clear about that. The next thing I see is one, two, three, four, five hands. Dave, what is your time? Could you stay for 10 more minutes? Yeah, yeah, I can stay till about 5.05. Five. Yeah, I do have to. 5.05. Five. So the, yeah. qu the questions have to be pithy and No, quick. I have to give quick, quick answers, yeah. Yep, exactly. So, um, Peter Fikowski. Okay, uh, Dave, I, I love the conversation with you and Judith, and I'm guessing Jim about education. Can we require that climate education include uh, a historically safe climate so that we make sure that students uh, educate are educated on that? It's not part of the scientific curriculum at this point and probably won't be unless we require it. Could that be done? You know, hopefully, I, I don't know if we can leverage the, the resolution a little bit more now that that bill has been signed. Um, you know, I think education curriculum is a little bit like um, rulemaking, agency rulemaking, you know, like OSHA would do or something. They'll go through a process now of trying to take that bill and turn it into actual curriculum. So I think, yes, what, we'll, what we can do and we will do, Peter, is um, weigh in with the um, State Department of Education now and say, you know, as a principal co-author of the bill, we want to make sure this piece is is clear, crystal clear in the curriculum. And we'll keep you apprised of what kind of response we get in that. Great Wonderful. question. Great answer, Jim. Thank you. Nice to see you, Dave. Uh, I'm Jim Wilson, Napa, California. I work with a student uh, climate justice group. Uh, they've been busy getting climate emergency resolutions throughout the county, all cities, the county, and, and et cetera, uh, with the, uh, their non-negotiable of uh, reaching uh, the 2030 limit. By that date, they need to have net zero climate pollution. Uh, beyond that, they're working uh, with your uh, office, Dave. They worked uh, quite a bit with Tara months ago. They wrote the letter in support of SR 34. Mm -hmm. uh, before it went into Environmental Quality Committee. They were watching that closely. They can't seem to make any ground on a, on a, on a congressional, uh, similar congressional bill. They were disappointed to see the 2050 standard lost in that committee work, but they are happy to see that the 300 PPM is being, it was kept, indeed it's there. What they're currently working on is uh, with several champions on their school board, the, they have three trustees who are helping them craft a, uh, a Napa Valley Unified School District resolution similar to your SR 34 
uh, that will uh, that will call for their school district to ask for mobilization statewide and nationally around climate restoration strategies. Thank you for your work. Thank yeah, that's you. all great stuff. I mean, if we can just keep knitting that together. And remember allies, um, Tara can fill you in later on some local allies we have here who are uh, pushing really hard with, uh, I know with Sol Lofgren's office, uh, congressional office down here, um, in, in bringing, tentatively bringing in Sierra Club partners to endorse um, our SR34 the con or equivalent at the congressional level. So if we can get, you know, but the school districts and it, that all adds up. I mean, it, at some point, haven't you, if you can get it in theory, I mean, I realize this is a moonshot, but if you could get every school district or even a majority of them uh, in, in the country to do what you just described, um, doesn't that just cover the country? I mean, what, what's, you know, who needs the federal government um, at that point, right? So um, everybody has to pay attention to that kind of work. That's great. Thanks, Dave. Um, um, Melanie needs to make a couple of announcements, so I'm going to cut it off. Um, Eric, uh, quickly, and Carol, you'll be the last one since you're the co-author of the book. Eric. Unmute, please. Yes, hi. Okay, I'm gonna speak like okay, Tom Hanks in the movie Big. Okay, I, I don't get it. Okay, so here's my here's my simple observations. Okay, it appears okay, we all agree we have some kind of a climate crisis in globally speaking, and if we stop passing the blame human made or natural, mm -hmm. for the time being, and Peter is presenting a solution for us which is, okay, in the millions instead of the trillions, then let me ask the simple questions. If we simply uh, avoid the opposition from geoengineering group, who else will be fighting this proposal? And if we limited our application point, limited from the uh, state of California, for example, Maybe in the coastline, okay, within the bond of California, we can do the ocean, we can do the atmosphere, and then if we can have some kind of way to measure on an annual basis what the progress is, and would that convince the rest of the world, okay, you know, at least on a starting point? And it we sounds and like we, a. I got it, Eric. This sounds like a postulation, like in, like, like in the a, a scientist takes on a, a a question. So you're in charge of that question, and you're in charge of finding the results to that question. And we're all here as your resources, and your, you know, we'll we'll be in the lab with you, whatever you need. Yeah, it's Thank Eric. That's Eric great. Eric's thing about I don't get it. You know, we don't get it. We, but we keep, you know, to your point, we just, we got to keep forging ahead and doing all the things that you just described. And hopefully that will, will be the proof or, or that'll help in and of itself, you know, save us, but also, uh, you know, pre-saving us. It just has to convince people to fall in line. But like I said, early on, it's, it's not just a sector that's in opposition. It's, um, we've got to get rid of this artificial division between if it doesn't kill the fossil fuel industry, then it's not good climate legislation versus if ours, you know, what you're saying, I think, and I'm saying all, I hope all of us are saying is, look, we got to get, we, we got to restore, we got to go carbon restoration here. We got to go hard. We got to, every, we should be throwing everything we have into it, at it. That makes sense. And it along the way, you know, um, we're shrinking the fossil fuel industry and if we shrink it down to nothing so be it but that shouldn't be the the the, the false premise that it's set up to be right now like hey if to talk about you know postulating oh let me look at this resolution if this doesn't go toward killing the fossil fuel industry if that's not its primary purpose then it's no good i mean our allies are would be allies shouldn't be saying that 
but it's it's a hard it's a, an emotional conversation um and people will they're dinging they're criticizing and downgrading the way they grade out legislators based on that believe it or not they are doing that you get an a rating if you don't believe in carbon capture um you know by environmental voters in california you get a C or a D or an F rating if you do support it. So you have to have the courage as an individual legislator to say, I think you're wrong um, because they see it as something that's going to like accidentally prop up the oil industry. Right. You know, <laughs> um, and, and, and of course the oil industry probably would like to figure out a way to do that, but that's beside the point. You know, we're not, we don't have 25 years to figure this out. We got, we got to do this right now. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And um, last, you get the final remarks before I turn it over to Melanie. Carol. Okay. My final remarks are to thank everybody for coming. Please spread the word about the foundation. And um, please, if you haven't, put your, if you're new here and you didn't get an email directly, um, someone sent it to you, then please put your name and contacts in the chat before we go so we can um, reach out to you in case you want to uh, more information. And I also basically wanted to say, um, I wanted to more uh, properly introduce Tara Sri Krishnan. I, I, maybe you were introduced before I got on, but just in case, Tara is, <laughs> is some, of the, some of the vast brain power um, within behind Dave Cortezzi and really helped make this happen that she's his legislative director. So thank you, Tara, as well as, Steve. Yeah, thank you. And turn it over for to Melanie for final words. And we have this, um, I don't know who we will have next month, but it will be someone equal to Dave Cortezzi. And thank you so much, Dave, for taking your time. This is just, this conversation is essential for the work that this group is committed to. Melanie? Thanks, Julia. Yes, well, uh, thanks for staying over and for joining us today. I did just put a link in to the chat for our weekly cli uh, climate restoration community calls, of which this Founders series is a part. We, uh, and I'm not even going to go into detail. We're just going to wrap up and stop for the day. I did also put into the chat uh, a link for our orientation that's coming up next week. I'll repost it there for you. And I think really I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for coming and uh, have a terrific evening. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Now. Bye.